Hello and welcome to a very special Christmas themed episode. I've got my Christmas tree, I've got my Santa hat, I've got a red shirt which is the closest I can really get to Christmas, and my Christmas mug. Mm. And I'm ready to combine politics with Christmas by explaining the real world parallels of the Netflix Christmas movie a Christmas Prince. That's right, we're gonna deep dive into the fictional politics of a paint-by-numbers Hallmark-esque Christmas romance movie. Because that's exactly the kind of person that I am. If you're not familiar, A Christmas Prince is a cinematic trilogy of Christmas romance movies, where Amber, our conventionally blonde American journalist, is given the chance to cover the story of our conventionally attractive brunette Prince Richard and his potential acceptance or abdication of the throne of the fictional European country of Aldovia. Spoilers, they're gonna fall in love. And there are subsequent movies that detail the different milestones of their relationship, like getting married and having a baby, which is like the cinematic trilogy of your 20s and 30s. It's very much like a Hallmark movie, but it's made by Netflix who is not sponsoring this video, by the way. This video will only have spoilers for the first movie, so feel free to get really invested in like the entire cinematic universe of A Christmas Prince and revel in its somewhat low budget romance. So let's begin. Aldovia has a constitutional crisis. The king is dead and Richard has one year to constitutionally speaking, accept the throne or he loses the right to it. And also, it is Christmas. This is my favorite subgenre. Christmas rom-com constitutional crisis films. Fun fact, there's a word for this exact kind of thing. Interregnum, interregnum, which the characters can't say either. This is when there's a gap between a government or reign of a monarch. For example, in 1481 to 1483, the Kingdom of Norway temporarily did not have a king. So this does happen. In the United Kingdom, they avoid this gap as a rule. The heir apparent automatically takes over and is the monarch as soon as their predecessor dies. There doesn't need to be a ceremony, it's just automatic. Though there is a customary gap between when their reign begins and their coronation. Queen Elizabeth II waited 16 months after the death of her father, King George VI, as it was a respectful time of mourning. Richard, on the other hand, isn't automatically king. The movie doesn't explicitly talk about this, but like his father did die on Christmas, right? Which is just a tragic way to open a premise of a light-hearted Christmas movie. So our first bit of information about Aldovia is that it is a constitutional monarchy, which means that the legal powers of the king or queen are limited by constitutional laws. Aldovia has a parliament where they debate and create laws much like they do in the UK. This differs from an absolute monarchy where whatever the king or queen says goes. No spoilers, but this will come into play later on in the film. Anyway, so like plot wise, Amber flies over and attends a press conference that Richard just doesn't show up to. Unlike all those loser journalists who like respect the law, she's keen for a scoop. And so trespasses into the palace and accidentally tricks someone into believing that she's the American tutor for Richard's younger sister, Emily. Emily is like, this curly haired child, I think she's 12. She has spina bifida, which means that for a lot of the film, she is either on a wheelchair or using crutches. And we have this really very ableist point where like out of nowhere, Amber is like, you're really brave. It's like, people aren't brave just for being disabled. That's, that's offensive. So yeah, we're off to a good start with some fraud a good introduction to a romance. There's an actual role for the kind of person who looks after a royal person's child and helps them with education. This is usually called a governess, but in this instance, the royal family apparently just gave up on any Aldovian governesses, probably because Emily puts mice in their chairs and whatever. And they were like, hey, you know what's the shining example of high quality education? America. 
Let's get a tutor. When Amber meets Emily, she refers to her directly by her name, which is big no. Emily replies, you are supposed to call me Royal Highness. It's a real world thing. It's not just this little spoiled child being like, you have to call me this. Emily, by the way, is actually really likable despite this introduction. If you encounter a British royal in the wild, it's important that you know the right words to avoid having a rabid dog or Prince Charles set upon you. The first time you address the Queen, it's Your Majesty. Whereas other members of the royal family, it's Your Royal Highness. But that's just for introductions. And if you still cannot escape after those introductions, back into regular society, you must then use mom or sir until you manage to successfully escape the situation intact. Saying your majesty will usually work for other royals from other countries too. Don't panic. Remain calm. The days of royal beheadings are behind us. They are no longer as dangerous as their ancestral counterparts. Probably. We learn from Emily that she cannot inherit the throne because she is not a man, which is unfortunately a real life issue, though not in all monarchies. Japan, Morocco, and Saudi Arabia, for example, don't allow women to inherit the throne. However, the Netherlands gave women the equal right to inherit the throne in 1983 and Norway in 1990. Even though Britain is the most famous example of a woman being a monarch, it only got rid of the rule that preferences boys over girls from inheriting the throne in 2011. Queen Elizabeth II only became queen because of a constitutional crisis. Edward VIII fell in love with Wallace Simpson, an American divorcee. The Church of England didn't want to marry the couple because her former husband was still alive and divorce is bad in their eyes. And so ultimately, Edward just abdicated. So constitutional crises with succession do actually happen in real life. There's a recurring joke in this cinematic trilogy where they threaten people with the dungeons, which doesn't actually pay off until spoilers. The third one, when Emily goes down to find like a ghost or something. I can't remember. There's a curse. It gets a bit weird. You'll have to watch it. Doesn't matter. Fun fact. Queen Elizabeth has slept in a dungeon. She did it when she was young in her favorite weekend residence, Windsor Castle. This wasn't like a fun, quirky tourist idea, like going to see a dungeon now, you're like, oh, that's where they tortured people. It's because the royal family figured it'd be safer during air raids during World War II. Maybe that wasn't actually that fun of a fact after all. Hey Google, do fun facts actually have to be fun? According to Wikipedia, Play-Doh was invented by accident. Originally manufactured as a wallpaper cleaner in the 1930s. So anyway, Amber has successfully tricked everyone into thinking that she's a tutor, despite not understanding maths like at all. Same. And then just gets invited to a royal function or gathering just because the plot demands it. And so she's there while we get introduced to Richard's slimy cousin, Simon with his silly smirk and his, his the whole face. He's being like a real mean twerp about his late uncle's Christmas ornaments when the queen, who has no executive power because sexist, shows off a very large decorative acorn. This is important. Remember the dead king's acorn. It's a clue about how incredibly messed up the entire political system of Aldovia is. No, really. Also, Amber insists on wearing Converse literally everywhere. When she, spoilers, marries Richard in the second movie, which coincidentally is called The Royal Wedding, her dress sense is a point of contention. This is because royals have a very strict dress code, as you might imagine. Tabloids are literally obsessed with every tiny facet of clothing that royals wear. It's ridiculous. Meghan Markle, an American who married into the royal family, received so much attention for her fashion choices. She was criticized for wearing a dress that showed off her shoulders. Scandalous. She was criticized once for wearing jeans, like a human being. Before you say Amber is clearly an analog for Markle, you must remember that 
Markle married Prince Harry in 2018, whereas A Christmas Prince came out in 2017. Wow, I can't believe A Christmas Prince was so powerful and beautiful and moving that it inspired Markle to follow her dreams and marry a royal prince. That's so amazing. Anyway, back to the plot. Emily figures out that Amber is not a tutor and uses this information to blackmail her into having fun, like making cookies and playing in the snow. It's during this outing to the snow that the romance between Amber and Richard really starts to blossom. But like, boo, whatever, who cares? Did you click on this video for a review of the generic love interests of a Netflix Christmas movie? Or did you come here for more real world parallels with the British monarchy? because I know what I care about. We also later then get introduced to Lady Sophia, who briefly attempts to romance Richard, but quickly decides against it, and so sidles up to Simon, once she realizes that he could be a viable way for her to ascend to power. Ooh, political intrigue. Sophia is a baroness, so she's noble enough to not be one of those filthy peasants, but she's also just a baroness, which is one of the lowest ranks in the nobility. So it's important to her to socially climb all the way up to Queen, which again, has no executive power. That's it. That's her one character trait. Good work, screenwriters. While Amber tries to learn more about Richard and peel back his mysterious veneer and brooding aloofness, she makes notes every few scenes on her laptop about the article that, you know, she's meant to write. Remember the premise? Eh. Which reminds me of Marion Crawford, of course, the governess to Queen Elizabeth and her sister when they were children. After Crawford retired, she wrote articles for Ladies Home Journal and a book about Elizabeth and Margaret's childhood called The Little Princesses. This is basically the only first-hand account we have of their childhoods because, you know, privacy. The royal family responded to this by literally never speaking to her again as is what would be a normal response if someone spent a lot of time around your children, getting really close to your family, and then writing about all your personal details of your lives for a magazine for profit. Yeah, this is a movie. So instead of normal reactions, everyone's just super chill about Amber's deceit. So Amber stalks Richard on a horse for some reason and then gets lost and then gets nearly eaten by a wolf. Which means, based off like the architecture of this palace and the geographical places of where wild wolves would live, this is probably in Eastern Europe, which means that this fictional country of Aldovia is probably located approximately near Romania. Now there's a fun fact. Also it was filmed in Romania, so there it is. That's the movie trivia. Anyway, so Richard saves her and takes her into a cabin in the woods, or something, or maybe it's near the palace, I don't know. We get a Christmas riddle about the dead king's acorn. Dead king's acorn, dead king's acorn. Like Richard's like, I saw this and I've been saving it all year for my mother. And then Amber and Richard nearly kiss, but like who cares because there's a riddle, right? Richard leaves and Amber does some snooping and we finally get back to the plot. Are you ready for a major bombshell? Amber discovers locked in a drawer evidence that Prince Richard was adopted. <gasps> He's not a legitimate heir to the throne at all. And he doesn't know. Oh, this is so juicy. Amber grapples with this information as it could make her career and make the best news article ever. Because like back at work, no one treats her with respect. She only got this job because everyone else was busy. Anyway, after this, Richard kisses her in the snow, but like, whatever, because I don't care, I don't care. Then Simon and Sophia, being slimy weasels, break into Amber's room and find the adoption certificate. <gasps> oh no. Richard decides to go ahead with the coronation, but Simon and Sophia reveal to those gathered that Richard is illegitimate and he storms off in rage. Simon, being the slimy wimy boy that he is, goes, hey, what if I was king? Well, I'm, huh? What if I was king? And despite the shock and horror of the situation, uh, the audience is just like, yeah. Like they just applaud. Like, all right, 
we haven't had a king for like a whole year, so like, yeah, get over with it, whatever, I guess. Richard confronts his mother, who reveals that they couldn't conceive, so adopted. But then somehow later, Emily happened, like a miracle. But like, she's a girl, so that doesn't matter because she can't inherit the throne, which is just, again, ridiculous. Come on, Aldovia, get with the times. Sweden did it in 1980. That's nearly 40 years prior to this film. Simon and Sophia marry so they can cement their rule, which is interesting because this isn't necessary for the monarchy. This is just a plot for Sophia to be a gold digger, which has some really sad implications about how women in Aldovia need to social climb to get any form of legitimacy and power by association, even in the 21st century. Or it's just sexist writing where women bad and shallow. Woman bad? There's a little bit of a problem with their plan because the queen must be present for an official ceremony to make Simon king. Which seems like a bit of a flaw in the system of government because like, what if the queen dies alongside the king? What if the queen decides to just take an extended holiday to France? She has so much power to prolong this interregnum and oh, oh wait, no, she's just gonna walk right into the parliament anyway. Nah. Aldovia appears to have only one chamber. This means that there's no chamber of review like the Senate. Or potentially that this is like a ceremonial area or a place for joint sittings where both houses come together. Australia, on very, very certain circumstances, has joint sittings. The UK also has two chambers, one elected, the House of Commons, and the other one unelected, the House of Lords. It is unclear whether or not Aldovia bothers to have any form of democratic elections. Who knows? Either way, the idea of like a parliament is pretty in line with this constitutional monarchy that I mentioned earlier. They have a prime minister, much like many monarchies have, and he mentions that they don't yet have a quorum. A quorum, by the way, is the minimum meeting of people to officiate business. In Australia, that number is, I think, a fifth of the house, and in the UK, it's 40 out of 650 members. So there's no universal minimum, but we can see in this shot that it's already got like a decent amount of people, but like everyone's kind of spaced out responsibly. So potentially a quorum is just more than half the members. Unless there's literally space for five times as many people and just that few people have shown up on Christmas to support like the imminent succession to the throne that constitutionally needs to happen. Which implies that most of parliament doesn't like Sophia and Simon, which like I get because I don't support them either. Which really implies a, a greater sort of motivation to the political conflicts within Aldovia that really just doesn't get enough screen time, Netflix. Where's the extended director's cut where we really get into the proper political conflicts? Anyway, meanwhile, Amber at the airport realizes that the dead king's acorn is actually a container with proof to Rich's legitimacy in it. Wow, because that's weird. That's what that weird r riddle that Richard just kind of forgot about means. Simon starts kneeling down on this tiny cushion, which is so embarrassingly unceremonial and awkwardly small, and he's about to be appointed by the Prime Minister before Amber interrupts with groundbreaking information, and I'd like to take a moment away from the plot to discuss the political implications of this scene, if I may. It's interesting that this scene sort of implies that the head of government has maybe a lot of executive power, and Aldovia invests a lot into its parliament. You'd think that you'd be kind of wrong. We'll see this in a minute. Parliament does appear to be important, at least in the instant of succession. This is kind of true in other monarchies as well. Even though the monarch is the head of state and therefore thus the highest position, higher than anyone in the parliament, the parliament in the UK, for example, can regulate the succession of the throne. It doesn't automatically have to be whoever is the oldest male, or since 2011, the oldest child. Speaking of Christmas and coronations, James Pitt Watson was the moderator of the General Assembly of the Church of Scotland in 1953, and he was the one who presented the Bible to Queen Elizabeth II during her coronation. The Christmas part of this anecdote is that he died on Christmas in 1962. Notice how I didn't preface that with fun fact. That's because I've learned. I've grown as a person. 
Now I just say facts. They don't have to be fun. Because the Prime Minister is ordaining this and there's no obvious signs of religious imagery or, or a priest of any kind, this kind of implies that Aldovia is a very secular nation. This is the opposite of the UK where the monarchy, the king or queen, is also the head of the Church of England. This, by the way, is why you can't be or marry a Catholic and be the monarch of England. Spain, on the other hand, that is a self-described secular state, which means that they have no official state religion, it has a Catholic king, Philip VI, because he's allowed to be. It's Spain. France is also a secular state, and despite the fact that France doesn't have a monarchy, for some weird reason, the president is automatically the co-prince of Andorra. That's just weird. Anyway, so back to the plot. Amber interrupts and provides Richard with a royal decree from his dead father that was hidden away in the acorn. Yeah, the, the Christmas ornament. The paper is read aloud to reveal that it has instantly changed the law so that Richard is the legal successor to the throne. Yay! Happy ending! Amazing! Aww! The Prime Minister declares that Richard is the official king of Aldovia, and all of Parliament applauds and they're like, Yay! We don't matter! They're pointless! Remember when I mentioned absolute monarchies? Well, turns out Aldovia created a parliament simply just to take time off the monarch's hands and the ability for the king to issue any sort of decree or executive order, even in secret, ratified by no one and under no legal review, is just still firmly embedded into the legal system of Aldovia from, from like the past. This kind of implies that democracy isn't very robust in Aldovia. It's a bit of a seedy and dark implication for this innocent Christmas romance movie. And so all the politicians just applaud because they have to, because their king can issue any law that he wishes. They better get on his good side. They better. This seems like very convenient to just change it so that, like an adopted child can become king. But wait, this has a historic parallel. Although currently no adopted child has legal rights to succession in the British monarchy, there was a time where the king decided who was his heir. Henry II was king from 1154 to 1189 and was the son of Geoffrey V. He succeeded Stephen. Not Stephen II or the third or whatever, just Stephen. Doesn't sound like a king's name. Not like John or Henry, or Edward, or Charles, or Athelstan. Royals have like five names that they just rotate around, I guess. Stephen made an agreement that Henry, despite not being his son, would inherit the throne upon his death. Effectively, Henry II was like Stephen's adopted son, even though at the time he was an actual adult. Mary Antoinette, Queen of France, adopted four children who were of common blood, but they didn't inherit the monarchy because the monarchy ceased to exist not long before their mother did as well. But hey, turns out the rules of succession can be changed on a whim by the king, and yet he didn't change it so that his, like, only daughter, Emily, could be eligible for it. Like, literally any time without requiring parliament to agree, or, like, the monarchy could have just at any point been like, yeah, Girls can be queen now. They can they can rule a country. Yet the sexist conservative nation of Aldovia continues to treat women as secondary to men. Wow. What a great backdrop to a Christmas romance movie. And even after all of this, Amber returns to New York, hands in her story to editor, and gets shut down. Ah. Oh well. But then Richard like flies over and admits his love to her and proposes to her on New Year's Eve. Oh, he literally has known her for like two weeks, most of which she was lying to him about who she was. And also she nearly cost him the monarchy, but it's romantic and it's Christmas, okay? And then in A Christmas Prince 2, The Royal Wedding, there's a massive economic crisis that's really poorly explained. And also it's Christmas. Then in A Christmas Prince 3, The Royal Baby, there's a weird plot involving a hundred years old tradition where there's like a 
peace treaty that they sign with like another fictional nation, like just back and forth. And if it doesn't get signed, then there's a curse on the children of the monarch who interrupts the signing. And also, it's Christmas. Please, Netflix, get in touch with me and I can pitch you several ideas, like A Christmas Prince 4, The Republic Movement, which threatens Richard and Amber's newly established power. And also, it's Christmas. A Christmas Prince 5, The Fascist Uprising, which threatens to bring Aldovia to the brink of civil war. And also, it's Christmas. Netflix, please hire me. And if you're not keen on expanding this trilogy into a quadrilogy or the other number ologies, you could get me as a consultant on The Crown, please. I can like work my way up the corporate ladder in time to supervise scripts for season five or six. I know nearly all of the political words. Like I know a lot of them. I'm not weird. I'm just passionate. Someone please make this happen. Well, anyway, Merry Christmas, happy holidays and enjoy your new year. Feel free to check out A Christmas Prince on Netflix if you so wish, not sponsored. Or maybe one of the like the dozen other like very similar premised movies like My Christmas Prince or Christmas with a Prince or A Prince for Christmas or Crown for Christmas, which is a Hallmark movie or A Christmas at the Palace. Maybe also on Netflix, The Princess Switch. So anyway, like subscribe, I guess. I normally talk about Australian politics, so Get interested in that. You can help me pay for my Netflix subscription by supporting me on Patreon, which has just gotten a little bit more affordable. And have a happy new year. I will see you next year.